If you would, you'd be opening your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. We're going to be using Luke 15 as uh, our text for this evening, verses 12 through 16. A while ago, somebody was uh, looking at the, the bulletin. Well, it was Phil. Phil was looking at his bulletin and he saw the, the title of the sermon for the night, Lessons from the Pig Farm. I said, yeah, there's Lessons from the Pig Farm. It makes good barbecue. And so uh, we're not going to have barbecue tonight. But we are going to talk about some lessons that we can learn from the prodigal son. I have a, a gentleman, a, a preacher, who uh, was in the same class as I was at uh, MSOP. And he was from Illinois. And uh, he was a pig farmer. He raises pigs. And... Uh, uh, oftentimes, every time I read Luke 15, verses 12 and following, I always think about him. Not because of the prodigal son, but because of where the prodigal son ended up. He ended up at a pig farm. You know, there are, there are many sermons that I'm sure that you've heard preached uh, on this, this text. But really, when we think about the text of the prodigal son, it's all about faithfulness versus unfaithfulness. And I believe that we can see those lessons being taught so very clearly in the life of this young man. Now, the word prodigal, prodigal uh, means a person who spends money in a recklessly extravagant way. And that's what this young man did. Now what I want us to do is read verses, uh, well, we'll read verses 11 through verse 16. And uh, then our next time we come together on a Sunday evening, I plan to look at verses 17 uh, through the end of the chapter. Beginning in verse 11, then he said, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided them his livelihood. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. And when he had spent all their uh, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want, and he went and, jo and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed his swine, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. What is the definition of of project, prodigal. Well, in the parable here of the prodigal son, a son receives his inheritance and he travels to a distant country. He wastes all his money in, in an extravagant way, very possibly. He become or became desperately poor. Then he returns to his father and he's received with open arms from his father. The word prodigal here means, and elsewhere, means rashly or wastefully extravagant. So when we see that the young man lived uh, in a prodigal type living, he, he was very extravagant in the way he lived. So, uh, why is this parable called the, par uh, the prodigal son? Because he asked for his inheritance, which he received. 
his, son, his father grants his request. This son, however, went and lived a wasteful and extravagant life in another country, thus squandering his fame, his, or his fortune, and, it, and eventually becoming destitute. So much so that he had to join himself with another uh, uh, citizen of that country. The word prodigal is, comes from a Latin term uh, which means to drive away or to squander. So I believe that we can actually say that this young man squandered his inheritance. It also means lavish. It has a sense of luxury that may, depending on the context, be negative, neutral, or positive. And in this case, it means negative. Can we today be considered a prodigal person? And that depends. Because even though we have not received our inheritance from God, and that's heaven, we can squander away the promise that God has given us. But we can also describe someone as prodigal, a prodigal son or daughter. If they leave their family or friends, often after a period of behaving badly, and then return at a later time as a better person. I think that we can say that they were a prodigal. Now while the account of Luke 15 never uses the word prodigal son, the account still teaches this word and uses it in verse 13 describing the lifestyle. <clears throat> Thus it's, it is by using the word there, it's... it's Yes, no, or, or it's, it is proving forth the definition of squandering or ways uh, with a lavish lifestyle. So that's the reason why I named this sermon tonight Lessons from a Pig Pen or Pig Farm. Because the young man ended up in this pig farm feeding the pigs very possibly eating the very food that the pigs ate. And I want you to think about this young man for a moment. He was of the Jewish faith. He was a Jew by, by nature. No doubt his family, his father had a, a nice home, a, a plenty to eat, plenty of clothes. He had everything that the young man would ever want it. And he ended up being with animals that God told the Jews not to eat. What a sad predicament. What caused this young man to fall victim? I want to suggest to you several things tonight. Yes, I don't have a PowerPoint tonight. The reason I don't have a PowerPoint is, is that uh, when I changed the Sunday morning sermon, I, I just had, did not have time to get the PowerPoint finished. But the first reason that this young man was found in a pig pen is because he was self-willed. It was all about what this young man wanted. When he wanted it was right then. You know, we cannot force someone to do what they don't want to do. We can't force a hard-headed person to change their way of thinking or even to obey the gospel or to study with us if they don't want to. But this young man in verse 12 wanted something and he wanted it now. And I want you to look at the words that Jesus uh, used on it. In verse 12, the young, younger son said to his father, Give me. What a hateful way to treat your father. And that's how I look at it. And that's the reason why I say that this young man was very self-willed because he didn't care about anything else. He just wanted what he wanted. 
Unfortunately, there are a lot of folks in our community that have this same type of attitude. I want what I want, and I want it now. Now, I've oftentimes, by reading this account, always asked, or had this question in my mind, why did he do this? Why did this young man act this way? Was he sick of being a son of a, of a loving father? Was he sick of living a nice life at his home? Was he tired of doing chores at the home? Maybe the father made him do chores. Was he sick of being told what to do? You know, all four of these reasons are reasons that young people today leave their homes. Because they're sick of being a son. They're sick and tired of living at home and under the rules of mama and daddy. They're, they're sick and tired of being told to, to do certain things around the house. They're sick and tired of being told what to do. And the very same reasons that young people leave the home today are these same four reasons are the reasons that people leave the faith. They're tired of God telling them what they must do. And when a person has this type of attitude, they are very self-willed. But whatever the cause, whatever caused this young man to demand from his father, we see that he was very selfish. But we also see that the father divided the inheritance equally among the two sons that he had. Luke chapter 12, if you will go there, just a couple of chapters back. In Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 13, teaches the same thing about selfishness and being self-willed. And this is the parable of the rich fool that Jesus spoke. Let's read that. One from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. This person sounds a whole lot like the younger brother in the parable of the lost son, doesn't he? Jesus, tell that person to give me what is rightfully mine. But Jesus said to him, Who may be a judge or an arbitrator over you? And then Jesus said, Take heed and be aware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist of the abundance of the things he possesses. Our life is not all about what we have. The Christian's life is all about what we will gain after this life is over. But our life here today is not, what, is not what we have, what we possess, because at death it doesn't belong to anybody. And surely it won't belong to anybody at the end of time. And then after Jesus said that, he spoke a parable. A ground of a certain rich man yielded plenty. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So I'll say, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, So you have many goods laid up for, your, for many years. Take your ease and eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool. This night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will these things be which you have provided? So he, so is he who lays up treasure for himself is not rich toward God. That verse 21 absolutely 100% teaches that the richest people on earth are the Christian because we are rich toward God. Now, in this parable, there were 15 personal pronouns that this young rich, young, rich fool used. Look what I have. I'm going to do this, and I'll do that, and, and I'm going to, to take ease, and I'm just going to have a grand old time. I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry for the rest of my life. I'm going to have bare barns, and it's just going to be great. <coughs> Can you not see the selfishness and the self-will of this young man in that parable. Being 
selfish and self-willed are tools that Satan uses against each one of us. These are used to get us to want to do some things that, that we should not. We should not even be considering. We should not even do it. These are tools that Satan will use to get us to compromise by thinking that whatever I want to do is not all that bad. Everybody's doing it. Don't fall victim to Satan and the tools that he uses to try to get you to become self-willed and selfish against God. Because, number two, this young man became selfish. Again, in, in uh, Luke 15 and verse 13, we see that it was all about now. It was all about today. This, in verse 13, we see that after he gathered all his things up together, he, he went into his, to a foreign country and he lived a luxurious type of lifestyle. He wasted his inheritance. But before that he, he even left, he's telling his father, give me. I, I oftentimes wonder when I'm, when I'm thinking about these parables that Jesus spoke, I, I kind of think a little bit ahead. And I, I, I think, I wonder what the father said to him to get him not to leave. Do you think that the father tried to persuade his younger son to stay with him? I, I believe so. I know the time that I left home. It was my senior year in high school. I'm, my parents tried their best. Don't leave. You don't need to leave. But I was self-willed and I was selfish and I wanted to do it. I wanted to grow up and I wanted to be my own man. Boy, did I learn some lessons. It's not all that easy out there by on your own. But we see that this young man wanted to please only himself. And that's how I was. I wanted, I wanted what I wanted. This younger son of this man was ungrateful for everything his father had done by, by demanding his inheritance before his father even has passed away. Are we ever ungrateful for what we receive? Are we ever ungrateful for the things that God gives us on a daily basis, hourly basis? Maybe we are at times. Maybe we need to examine ourselves at that. But then we see, thirdly, that this young man decided to separate himself from safety. When we pull ourselves away from safe, a safe zone, a safe place, we're in the midst of danger. In our homes, our parents do their best to protect us with by telling us what we can and can't do in the home, but also what to put in our minds and what to put before our eyes on television and radio and music and such. They're trying to shelter their children with safety. But there comes a time when sometimes children think, seem to think they know more know what's better for me and that's what this young man said or thought because again in verse 13 we see many days after he got his, his inheritance the younger son gathered everything together and he left he journeyed to a far country and there wasted his possessions Friends, do we ever allow ourselves to become so selfish and so self-willed that we could find ourselves pulling away from God? Experts say that if you want to remember a name, you repeat it three times. They don't help me. I still forget names. I've been here seven and a half years, and there's sometimes when I'm talking to some of you, I can't remember what your name is. Is this old age? I don't think so. I just think it's just it's too much on my brain. But how about pulling away from God? I, I do believe that in our congregation, 
based on the fruit that people are, are showing. We can see people pulling away from God. And they're being selfish. And they're being self-willed. You see, it begins by missing a couple of church services. And then, then it kind of becomes more and more. And then it, then it become, uh, begins or starts to happen that, that they start missing a few events from the church. Maybe vacation Bible school or, or maybe a, a fellowship meal. Maybe it gets to the point where they stop participating in worship services or Bible classes. They say uh, uh, when, when, when someone is trying to find someone to lead the congregation in worship, I guess someone else, I just don't feel like doing it. Do you see people pulling away from God when they start doing that? To me, it, it, it looks like it would, somebody would want to, to serve God and lead the congregation, but instead of wanting to lead and help the congregation, they don't want to, and, and really these are signs of people that are stepping back and stepping away. A man who actually retired told me once that when he retired from work, he retired from the work of the Lord. Is that not a prime example of being self-willed? <coughs> when we separate ourselves from God in any way, in any amount, when we separate ourselves from the family of God, we are getting closer and closer to unfaithfulness. We are scooting closer and closer to danger. We are crossing the fence, as it were, getting close to the edge of a mountaintop, a cliff, and if we're not careful, we're going to find ourselves falling off that cliff. But no, people have to see how close they can get to danger instead of safety. But there's something else about this young man. He indulged himself. And we see that when we, we're told that he... Uh, he wasted his his possessions, his money with prodigal living. He fulfilled his appetite on fish, the fleshly desires. Now you remember what John wrote in 1 John chapter 1 verses 5 through 10? John wrote this. This is the message which we have heard from him, speaking about God, and proclaim to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Every, most every time you see the words light and dark in Scripture, it represents sin for darkness and righteousness for light. But then he goes on, he says, if, you, if we say we have fellowship with God, with Him, while we walk in darkness, sinfulness, we're lying. And do not practice the truth. There you go. I think the ESV has really nailed that word. This, this verse. Because he said, uh, the, the translation of the ESV says, if we have fellowship with God, or if we say we do. In other words, if we say we're being Christians, if, we're doing, if we say we're doing the best we can, while we walk in sickness, in sinfulness, we are not doing the best we can if we're walking in it, if we're practicing it. We're lying to ourselves, we're lying to God, and we're not even practicing the truth. But, John says, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ is cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Who is the greatest deceiver that we know in the Scriptures? And that's Satan. Satan is out there to try to get to deceive us. And then in verse 8, John goes on, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And he goes, If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins 
and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, God a liar. And the Word is not in us. There is a lot of information in this text of 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. But James said something similar to this, or wrote something similar to this in James chapter 3. In James 3, and beginning in verse 15, that wisdom comes down from above. But the wisdom that they were talking about in this text is not from from above, but is earthly, it's unspiritual, is demonic. For where, there, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceful, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy, and good fruits, impartial and sincere. Notice verse 16 again. Because James said that where jealousy and selfish ambition, isn't that what this young man in this parable did? He had selfish ambition. It's what I want. Doesn't I don't care about what my father needs, what this home needs, or I don't, I don't care what how well he's taking care of me. It's what I want, and I want it now. Almost like a small brat doing it, uh, giving it uh, a temper. Look at verse 14 of Luke 15. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Here this young man is. He doesn't have money anymore. All the friends that he had made with his wild living are no longer there because the money runs out, the friends leave. He had no family to help because he's a long way off from home. He was destitute. He was out the basic necessities for life. He had no idea what he was going to do. He was in a tough predicament. Friends, if we are not careful as Christians, we can find ourselves without the necessities for the Christian life. And that happens when we stop praying. That happens when we stop worshiping God. That happens when we stop having fellowship with one another and fellowship with God. We're going to find ourselves without the necessities of life if we continue on living to indulge ourselves instead of living for God. So what happened to this young man? Well, we see that he would become humiliated. He felt that he was not deserving of any respect whatsoever. Look at verse 15. He went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed his wine. He was feeling so beat up and so let down. This young boy was now facing the lowest of lows. Now I know that a parable, there's a reason for parables. It has a meaning. But why didn't the young boy leave at that point in time and go home? Why did it take this young boy to get down to the, to the pit of the pig before he decided, I need to go home? He was already beaten up emotionally. He was already broke physically. He was already humiliated by feeding pigs and even possibly eating their food. How much lower can a person go? In verse 16, we see that this young boy was starving. Not only was he starving physically from food, I, I want to suggest to you that he was starving. He was in starvation of, 
of physical contact with his family. He no longer had his father by his side. And friends, when Christians turn their back on God, we are starving spiritually, but we're also starving because we don't have that relationship with God anymore. God doesn't push us away. We push God away from us. In this account, he was dying of for literal food. But I think he was dying because he needed companionship. And there we find the young man in a pig pit. As we look at these these examples, I guess you can say, of why, why I took him here. By review, he was very self-willed. It was clear that he was selfish in his desires. It, it, it is also clear that what he did separated him from the safety of his of his father's home. It is also clear that he indulged himself in, in a lifestyle that caused him to waste all of his money. And because of all this, he was humiliated. He was starving emotionally, physically, dying in a pig pen. Friends, there is hope for us if we ever find ourselves in this kind of predicament. <clears throat> because next week, Lord willing, we're going to see how this young man came to his senses, got, got wits about himself, and decided, I'm pulling myself up. I'm going to go and I'm going to tell my father I'm sorry. And he did certain things. There were certain actions that had to come upon him that he had to overcome in order that he had to do in order to overcome unfaithfulness. What about you? Are you like this young prodigal son? Do you have the characteristics that he has and the things that he has done? I, I know that the younger that we are, sometimes we do, but the older we get, the wiser we get. At least I hope that's the case. But the but wisest thing that you and I can do is become one of God's children and become God's children His way. And God has made it clear that regardless of whatever we have done, He will forgive us and He will call us one of His own. If we're just willing to do what he said in order to get his forgiveness. If God can forgive Paul, who was known as Saul, for all the things that he did to the church, by putting Christians in prison and sometimes even contributing with the death of Christians, and God could forgive him and use him as a tool for the church. God can forgive me and you and use us both for the church. So if you need to respond to the Lord's invitation tonight, don't delay. But come now as together we stand.